Welcome everyone and good evening. Good evening everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to join myself, um, Rashid Rabiu and Mr. Jagran Singh here today um, as we talk about elbow and wrist fractures. I'll be giving um, most of the um, presentation. Mr. Singh will be giving us some expert um, advice and information along the way. So, so again, this is part of the um, fracture school um, schedule. And we are now in week, I think week, was it five? Cool. Uh, week three, session five. Wow. Okay. Well done. Um, <laughs> so, oh, great. Uh, so today we're going to focus on some um, basic um, objectives. I know we've only got 30 to 45 minutes per session. So there's only so much we can talk about with regards to the elbow and the wrist. So we're going to go through the basic anatomy of the elbow and the wrist, um, focus history and examination when it comes to orthopedics and also common injury patterns in the elbow and the wrist as well as um, investigations you can order in a &E or when you see patients acutely. We would also talk about acute management of how to stabilize patients before you then transfer them or refer them to your local orthopedic specialists. So we're gonna start off with the elbow joint. So the elbow anatomy. So the elbow is made up of um, two articulations in, in, in fact, it's got the medial and a lateral articulation. So medially, which is on the inside, we have, um, a joint between the distal humerus and the proximal ulna. So this is the ulnar humeral joint. So this is where the trochlea, so this is a trochlea here. Uh, the trochlea articulates with um, the trochlear notch, which is on the other side of the um, olecrona. On the lateral side, we have an articulation between the head of the radius and the capitellum. So this is the radio capitella joint. Now in actual fact, the bulk of the elbow is actually this joint, the ulnohumeral joint. That's what gives you the flexion and extension. Um, most people might think that the elbow joint is also involved in pronation and supination, but this is mainly a movement of the forearm. So the forearm joints, which are the radial ulnar joints. We have a proximal and a distal radial ulnar joint, which we'll go into a bit more detail um, later on. Some other important anatomy around the elbow joint is the, the nerves that course around it. So we know about the ulna, the medial, and the radial nerves. So the ulna nerve at the elbow joint is posterior to the medial epicondyle. So that's the ulna nerve traveling down here. More proximally, so higher up in the arm, the ulna nerve lies in the anterior compartment, but then it pierces posteriorly as it crosses past the elbow joint. In the middle or centrally, we have the median nerve, which essentially passes anterior to the elbow joint, accompanied or accompanying the brachial artery. Um, laterally, we have the radial nerve. So here it's anterior to the lateral epicondyle. Now, more proximally, or so higher up in the arm, the radial nerve is actually a posterior structure. So it, it courses around the humerus and then down, down at the elbow, it comes anteriorly to go past the lateral epicondyle. So when you see patients in a &E or in ED and you want to assess them, it's important to kind of have a focused history. So when you know there's a particular injury or uh, orthopedic concern, we would like to know if it's a high or a low energy injury. So has someone fallen off a tall building? Have they been involved in a road traffic accident? Or have they just fallen from a standing, standing height, which is a, essentially a, a fragility fracture? It's important because, because this affects how we manage the patient. If it's a high energy injury, we are managed according to the ATLS protocol, which we might go into detail, which you've talked about previously. So you must ask about the mechanism of injury. So was it high, was it low energy? You must talk about, was it a fall? Was it a direct blow that caused a fracture or a dislocation? And was the elbow flexed or extended? That would also give an idea of what forces acted around the elbow joint at the time of the injury. You should also ask about all the joints that might have been um, affected. So joints such as your shoulder joint, your wrist joint, and also your neck can be affected by um, a fall or direct blow. As part of your secondary survey, always take an ample history. So this involves uh, allergies, medication, um, past medical history, last meals, and other events surrounding the actual injury. It's important because if you let the orthopedic team know that, they then can also triage a patient as to whether or not they need an operation today, in a few hours, or overnight. It's important that these details are collected. So like you see in these pictures, 
um, check for any neck pain, check for any shoulder pain, check for wrist pain, or, and also finger pain as well. Focused examination. We tend to um, examine our patients using a look, feel, move approach. So essentially for any fracture or any joint problem, look, feel, then move. So look for any obvious deformity, such as the one you can see here, which is uh, what looks like a posterior dislocation of the elbow. Look for if the injury is open or closed. So you want to check whether or not there's any wounds. That means that the bone communicates with the outside world. That's an um, orthopedic emergency and generally is managed in trauma centers. Look for swelling, look for bruising, and look for a change in colors. If you see a pale limb, you're thinking to yourself, there might be some vascular compromise. Again, an orthopedic emergency. Feel for a pulse. So feel for a radio pulse. Um, you can also feel for, um, you can also test um, the blood supply to the palms. You can look for the capillary refill time. Feel the temperature of the arm. If it's warm, proximally and cold distally, that could signify the vascular compromise. And go for sensation, your light touch, your pain prick. Now, this might be difficult in the acute setting when your patient's in a lot of pain. So um, try your best to make a good um, neurological examination. And then you can move. So assess the range of motion, both actively and passively. So like I said before, the elbow joint is a hinge joint. So you're looking for flexion and extension. So the normal range of motion is between zero and 150. Um, so that might be different or that might change based on the patient's presentation. And if they're in pain as well, that might affect what they're able to do. Also, also check supination and pronation. I know I've mentioned the fact that they are forearm movements, but it's also important because it lets you know if there's any other structures around the elbow joint that have been affected. Again, you also want to examine the joint above and below. So we've been told, and you guys have been taught how to present x-rays and how to present um, fractures throughout your course. So although I don't plan to go through each x-ray today, um, going through this PIPJ and parts, keep it in mind when you see um, the images I'm going to show you going forward. And I must say that all the images I show today are not mine. I've gotten them from the internet and I've linked the references beneath them. So, in a and &E, when a patient comes in, the first thing you want to get is an x-ray. So um, of the elbow, we like looking at the AP, so anterior posterior and the lateral x-rays. Um, this gives us a general idea of what's going on and sometimes, or most times, gives us our diagnosis. In some situations, you might want to ask for a CT scan, particularly if you want to get the orthopedic team involved and they plan to do any operations. It's important for looking at intraarticular involvement. We're gonna focus on x-rays. Now, some important lines to look at on your x-rays, in particular your lateral x-ray, are your anterior humeral line and your radio capitella line. Now, the anterior humeral line is a line that, when drawn from the anterior surface of the humerus, yeah. intersects the capitellum um, in its um, third, so its middle third. So you can see this blue line here, it's anterior on the humerus and it intersects the capitellum, so this part of the distal humerus or the elbow joint in its middle third. Another line that's important is your capitella line. Now this line is drawn from the middle of the radius straight through the head and into the elbow joint. In any film you take, so be it anterior, posterior or oblique, that line should always pass the capitellum. If these are deranged, it means there's a, path there's a pathology or an injury to the um, elbow joint. And we'll go into that in more detail in a second. So here, we can see two different x-rays and, and so two different patients at two different times. On the left-hand side, we see a lateral radiograph of a skeletally mature individual, so it's like a child. And it shows that the anterior humeral line does not bisect the capitellum. So that means that there must be a pathology in the distal humerus or in the elbow. Here, it's quite obvious in that it's a fracture going through the supracondylar region of this child's x-ray. Now, on this other x-ray on the right-hand side, we can see that it's a lateral radiograph again, or maybe we're gonna call it an oblique radiograph, um, of the elbow of someone who is a bit more skeletally mature. It shows that there is a, the radio capitella line does not bisect the capitellum, which is down here. And again, that means that there's a radial um, dislocation from the elbow joint. <laughs> 
So this picture just kind of summarizes what I've said to you so far. The anterior humeral line does not bisect the capitellum, and the the capitellar line does not bisect the capitellum. And these are both on lateral views. So now we're, we're going to go through some x-rays of um, fracture patterns of different fractures. Um, in this particular um, slide, I'm showing you an AP and a lateral plane radiograph of a skeletally immature person. There is no um, name or date of birth to identify the individual. And we can see that there's a fracture here. So in AP, there is a, what well, appears to be a transverse fracture with some translation with a distal fragment moving laterally by about 10 to 20%. On the lateral film, we can see that there is an extension at the fracture site, um, which signifies that this, when put together, is a supracondylar fracture. And it is an extension type of fracture. In some situations, the distal fragment can move anteriorly, and that would be a flexion type of fracture. You can also classify according to intraarticular injuries. So this is an intraarticular fracture. It is high energy due to its high combination, and it shows involvement of both the medial and lateral columns of the elbow joint. So here we see that both the lateral side, so with the radius, and both the medial side are both affected and fractured from the humerus. So this is a very high energy injury, and it signifies a two column injury to the elbow joint. So in summary, the main ways to classify your elbow fractures are essentially extraarticular and intraarticular. And then you can describe them further based on your PIPJ and parts um, acronym that you were taught earlier on. Now, there are some other fractures that um, affect the elbow joint, um, which you'll see on a day-to-day -day practice. So these include things like your olecranon fractures. Now, this is generally an intraarticular fracture. It can be simple, can be comminuted, and can be minimally or greatly displaced. And all these would affect how we manage the fracture in the long term. So this is an AP and lateral radiograph of a skeletally mature individual showing an olecranon fracture and the lateral view. It is comminuted, it is intraarticular, and it is displaced fully. It's hard to tell the translation because you can't really see it much on the AP field. Now, I thought it'd be important to mention what we call occult fractures. So these are fractures that um, we know are there, but we can't fully see or fully appreciate on an X-ray. And in this situation, we tend to order CT scans for a better um, assessment, a better diagnosis. So in this particular um, film, we have an AP and lateral yeah. of an adult right. elbow. Again, there are no identifying markers on these films. What we can see is that it's difficult to assess where there might be an obvious fracture line here. For some people, you might have picked up that we have an essentially undisplaced fracture of the radial head. In some situations, it's a lot harder to see. Now, there are some markers in this x-ray that will point towards a pathology in the elbow joint. And these are called fat pads. So we have an anterior and a posterior fat pad in this x-ray. Now, fat pads are essentially um, fat that are in and around uh, our joints. In the, in the elbow, the anterior fat pad can generally be normal, can be seen in a lot of adults and some children. That's because the anterior humerus is flat and therefore the fat sits nicely on top of it. Now, when we come to a, to a posterior fat pad, however, there is an olecranon fossa and generally the posterior fat pad sits in the olecranon fossa and then you can't see it on a lateral x-ray of a normal elbow. So when you see a posterior fat pad, you should know or think that there must be a problem with the elbow joint because it essentially means that the elbow joint has been expanded by something. That is generally due to blood in the acute setting. So after a fall or trauma to the elbow, you say to yourself, it's most likely there's an intraarticular fracture because there's a posterior fat pad. Now, if someone was to inject the, the joint us also with different so with steroids or whatever, you would also get a, post, a posterior fat pad. But in trauma, we think to ourselves that it must be a hematoma. So as you can see, there's an anterior and a posterior fat pad, and there's a fracture line going to your radial head. 
So this picture also kind of demonstrates what the fat pad is. Anteriorly, we have a fat pad that lines on your distal humerus to your radial head. And posteriorly, that fat pad usually sits in that olecranon fossa, but then gets bulges out um, at times of injury. We also have dislocations of the elbow joint, and these generally are described in relation to the distal fragment. So for example, if your radius and your ulna move posterior to the distal humerus, we say that's a posterior elbow dislocation. If they move anterior to it, we say it's an anterior elbow dislocation. If they move lateral to your distal humerus, it's a lateral elbow dislocation, and medial and medial elbow dislocation, and so on and so forth. The most common dislocations are posterior lateral. And again, you can go into things like the terrible triad and ligaments around the elbow joint, but I think that's going into a bit too much detail for this talk. So what's our acute management? So when you see any patient with an orthopedic injury, the most important thing to do is to make them comfortable. So you must give them and um, prescribe them analgesia immediately. So that involves things like fastamol coding um, and then things such as brufen, morphine, and so on and so forth. You go up the WHO pain ladder. You can also give intra intravenous medication. And if you, try, if you plan to reduce it, but you put it into a splint or a back slab or a cast, it's important to also give them some, um, for example, some gas, some nitrous oxide, which helps as a temporary um, pain control. Now to reduce elbow fractures or dislocations, it's probably easiest with the patient lying down, just so that the arm can dangle and you can feel more comfortable in reducing it. All it involves, just like many other fractures, is applying some traction, reversing the um, mechanism of injury, and then putting it into a cast. So in this particular picture, you have seen that some traction has been placed onto the um, distant arm, some flexion. Again, this is probably to reduce a posterior elbow dislocation. And then you make sure that any medial or lateral displacement is corrected. And then you can also test your movements once you've done it. And once you've done this, you can clap for yourself and put the patient into an above elbow back slab. It's important that after you do such a maneuver, you check again your new vascular stages and then you repeat new x-rays. You can make sure that it's in a better position and that the person's arm is not being compromised. So that kind of does it for our basic introduction or our basic um, management for elbow injuries. We're now going to move on to, to the wrist, which is um, the, distal, the more distal joint. So generally, when we think about the wrist, we think about this box, which is essentially a place that starts at the distal radius and ends at the base of the metacarpals. But when we think only talk about the wrist joint in particular, we're talking about this articulation here. So this is where the distal radius articulates or joins up with the proximal carpal bones. So in particular, your scaphoid and your lunate bones. The ulna or the distal ulna is also in, involved similarly to the radial head in and around the joint, but it's not strictly part of the wrist joint. The, the distal ulna articulates with the distal radius at the distal radial ulna joint, as you can see here. The um, wrist joint is a condyloid joint. That means it's a modified ball and socket joint, essentially. So it can flex, it can extend, and it can deviate both radially and ulnarly. So flexion, extension, widow deviation, and ulnar deviation. So we're going to focus mainly on distal radius fractures because this is going to form the bulk of the injuries you see um, in a day-to-day -day, day -day practice. So the most common orthopedic injuries we see, they occur more in women than men, particularly in the older population. They have a bimodial distribution. By that we mean in the younger population, we have high energy fractures, whereas in the older population, we have low energy fragility fractures, generally again, in the female population. Um, half of them are intraticular and half are intraticular. And the main risk factors as we get older are osteoporosis. Again, it's important to take a focused history and to ask yourself, is it a high or a low energy injury? Do I need to involve the trauma team or can I manage this myself? You need to ask the patient how they fell. Was it a fall on the outstretched hand? Was it a direct blow? Was the wrist flexed? So flexed and it fell onto the, the flexed wrist or was the wrist extended and it fell onto the extended wrist? This all forms part of your history and it's, part, and it's important in your clinical assessment. 
ask about the other joints, ask about the forearm, the elbow, the shoulder, the neck. Make sure that there's nothing else involved. Make sure there's no head injury, for example. Again, take a second view survey and take your ample history, because this is important for your planning going forward. Can you give them some anesthesia? How much, what's the past medical issue? What can they tolerate? What medication can you give them? What are they allergic to you? All these are important in your acute assessment of the patient. Now, a focused examination, again, look, feel, move. It's always gonna be look, feel, move for any joint. Look for any obvious deformity. Here we can see an obvious deformity of the wrist joint. So we know there's, there's a problem there we need to assess. Look for an open wound. Again, if it's an open injury, you can um, speak to your trauma center. Look for swelling, look for paleness in the hand, which, which could signify a radial artery um, injury. Check the pulse. Um, check for temperature, compare it to the other arm, make sure that they feel the same. And check for sensation. Again, compare it to the, almost, to the other unaffected limb. Then check for your range of motion. Like I said before, it's a condylar joint. And what you can get from the wrist is flexion, extension, radial and ulnar deviation. You can also test for pronation and supination because close by you have the distal rigid ulnar joint. And you want to make sure that there's not been any damage to that joint as a result of, you, of your acute injury. And again, test for your fingers and test for the elbow. So test the bones of the joints above and below. Again, same investigations. Acutely, you were asking for radiographs. So what we look for on the hand and the wrist are PA, so posterior anterior x-rays, lateral x-rays, and those are the two main things we look for. Some people also get oblique views as well, although they're not as um, useful in the acute setting. Again, if you think there's any joint line involvement or it's a complex pattern, it's important to get things such as a CT scan so that the orthopedic team can know exactly what they're looking at and how to manage it appropriately. So this here is a lateral of the, of the wrist, distal um, forearm and the wrist. Here we have an oblique and here we have a posterior anterior film. And this is a CT scan here, which, which shows an intraarticular fracture, which involves um, the radial styloid, the lunate, and also the, the distal radial ulnar joint. But again, that's a bit complex. Now, there's some important things we're looking at when we look at x-rays, um, important parameters of normality. So these um, help guide us to who is an operation and who can be managed without an operation in the cast. So remember 22, 11, 11, or however you want to remember it. We're talking about the radial inclination, the radial shortening, and the volar tilt of the distal radius. So in an average individual out there, in a normal average population, the radial inclination, so that is the angle at the um, distal point of your distal radius is around 22 degrees. I'm going from the radial styloid down to the to the base of the um, of the joint. The radial height, again, from the um, distal radial ulnar joint to the radial styloid is 11 millimeters, and the, the volar tilt, so the tilt of your distal radius towards your palm, is around 11 degrees. This allows you to do activities with your hand. It makes your arm, your hand and arm and shoulder functional. So 22, 11, 22, both on the AP and the lateral films. Um, if there's also an intraarticular involvement, so if there's an intraarticular fracture or a fracture line going through, then again, all these are taken into account as to whether or not we manage this conservatively in a cast or operatively without, um, without a cast and in things with plates and screws or wires, for example. Now, what can we accept? We can accept less than, so in regards to your radial inclination, we can accept a reduction of around five degrees. So if you go down to 17 degrees, that's acceptable. And for now, I'm talking about the younger population where we kind of move managers operatively. In terms of the radial height, again, we don't want, any, we don't want it to be shortened by more than um, um, three to three, three, three millimeters, for example. I think or definitely uh, not, except um, radius is shorter than the ulna, yeah. to, be, to be precise. Yeah. You know, it's easy for, if you look at the x-ray, do not accept a situation where the radius is shorter than the ulna, because that will lead to poor biomechanics of the wrist. And 
inclination you mentioned, and then the volatility. Yeah, and the volatility is important. So we don't want to rest our faces dorsally or rest our faces backwards. So any dorsal angulation is generally not um, acceptable. We generally try our best, be it by reduction close to get some volatility. Um, sometimes you can compare it to the other side. Um, some will say that if you can accept it, if it's within 20 degrees of the other side. But generally, we just don't accept anything that faces backwards. So just up to the neutral. Neutral is the maximum. Yeah, the so neutral being flat. So again, I'm just going to go through some x-rays of that you might see in your day-to-day -day practice. Um, generally, distorted fractures can be classified as being, again, extra-articular or intra-articular. So your know, extra-articular fractures are generally what you see regularly, uh, particularly in an oily population. So what we have here is an AP and lateral radiograph um, of a skeletally mature individual showing a lateral film that we have a dorsally angulated fracture that is comminuted and shortened. On the AP, we can see that a severe shortening whereby the um, radius is, I mean, the ulna is definitely longer than the radius. Um, and also it's the translation on the AP is not so much difficult to say, it's fully 100% off. Now this, is an intra-articular injury and signifies a more high energy injury. So here you can potentially say this is a low energy fracture, but here it's a high energy. We can see that there was a high degree of combination. The bones are essentially destroyed. And we have here an off-ended wrist. So where the corpus is lying posterior or dorsal to the, to the um, um, radial end. And this is a 100% translation again. In our day-to-day -day practice, we generally have um, eponyms. So we got a few fractures that are um, described according to who um, discovered them or who described them first. So here we have a um, colis fracture, which is described in the adult population, not in the pediatric population as this x-ray might suggest. But essentially a colis fracture is defined as an extraarticular fracture, which is within two centimeters of the wrist joint that is dorsally angulated. So here we can see that this individual has fallen on an outstretched extended wrist. And therefore the forces acting on this wrist mean that this is the palm and this is the back of the hand. The bone tends to be pushed dorsally, so backwards. So hence you get a picture such as this. And it's described here as almost like a dinner fork deformity, like your fork at home. Again, it's important to make sure that the person's neurovasculature is intact and document your findings before and after any manipulation that you perform. Now, the reverse to this is something that's called the Smith fracture. So it's when an individual falls on the flex wrist. So before we had an extended wrist, so here was extended, here it's flexed. So when you fall on, on a flex wrist, the forces acting on the wrist or the distal radius would push that distal fragment towards your palm. And so you get a picture like this, on the lateral view, where um, you have a volar angulation and a volar displacement of your distal fragment. And your hand will look like this. Again, you're still looking at swelling, we're looking at bruising, uh, we're looking at an obvious clinical deformity, which points us towards a, a, a distal radius fracture. So these two are extra-articular fractures. Um, I'm just gonna give you one more eponym for an intra-articular fracture. This is the Barton's type fracture. So a Barton's fracture is an intra-articular fracture that either involves the palmar, so the palm side, or the dorsal, which is the back side, lip of your distal radius. So this picture here shows a dorsal Barton fracture. So if you can appreciate that this is the distal radius and its intra-articular fracture line goes through the dorsal, comes out through the dorsal aspect of the distal radius. So we call this a dorsal Barton fracture. On this lateral radiograph of the wrist, we can see again that there was another shear fracture, which is intra-articular and distal radius. So this is the articular segment, and this is the fracture line. But well, in this case, the fracture comes out on the palmar aspect of the distal radius. So we call this a palmar, or oh, sorry, a volar Barton fracture. 
So this is one type of intraarticular fracture, or two types. There's other types as well, again, which I, know, I didn't think were necessary to discuss today, such as the die punch fractures and your chauffeur fractures. But you can essentially go and look at them in your spare time. They are just intraarticular fractures of different um, morphologies in the distal radius. In terms of your acute management, it makes no difference. If you, you manage them the same, and you refer to your orthopedic team, who will then manage them properly in the long term. So, like I said before, any acute patient, it's important to make sure they've been given adequate analgesia, go up your WHO ladder, and make sure that the pain is well controlled. This would help the patient and to help you manage the patient because they'll be a lot more comfortable. So this picture shows a hematoma block, which is not always recommended. Um, for example, the British Orthopedic Standard says a base block, but that's not normally done in EDS. It's quite a dangerous thing to perform if you haven't got enough training. Generally, we tend to pull most wrists with simple nitrous oxide, which is a gas and air, which I'm sure a lot of you know about in any case. Hematoma block involves putting some local anesthetic into the fracture site, and it gives very good pain relief for um, close reduction in ED, actually. Um, it's very effective alongside your other um, pain management. It helps the patient relax so you can reduce it. And to reduce the fracture, essentially you're doing the same as before. You are just reversing the um, mechanism of injury. So you're applying traction, usually for a prolonged time. 10 seconds of traction is not enough. 30 seconds is not enough. You have to go for at least two to three minutes or maybe even longer to fully relax the muscles and disengage the fracture ends. You then exaggerate the fracture initially to, to unlock the fracture fragments. You need to pull, pull, pull them apart, disengage them, and then bring it back to its original position. So remember, you are reducing the distal radius. You're not reducing the hand. So just don't just grab the hand and try and move it because you lose a lot of your movement by doing that. Try and grab the distal fragment in your, between your palm and your thumb with an assistant and manipulate that fragment. Don't just manipulate the hand because a lot of the movement is then lost in your wrist. So once you've done that, you place the patient in a below elbow back slap or a splint or a posterior splint. And then check again the nerves, check for capillary field time, and then check by asking for another x-ray to see if you've improved the position of your fracture. So I was given 30 minutes and I think that's around 30 minutes now, actually. Any questions for us? Oh yeah, we're gonna mention about the Galaxy and the Montegio fractures. I'm sorry that we didn't include them in our talk because again, we, I, I thought that you may, you may want to ask about that. But yeah. Essentially they are. I can, uh, I can bring up some pictures, uh, Rashid, if you want. I can bring up the Google Chrome and bring up some pictures. Yeah, please do. Yeah, we'll do. Give me one second. I'll start sharing my screen. Share. Should I stop sharing or can you? I think it should be automatic. Can you see this? No. Can you see my screen? I can't. Maybe Rashid? I should stop sharing mine then. No. I should, let me stop sharing and then uh, yeah. we can share later on, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So go for yours. All right, let me try again. What about now? Can you see it? Yeah, it says fractures. It says you started sharing. I, I just can't see what you're sharing. All right. It says you started sharing. Let me, let me try like this. What about this way? It might be your connection. Oh yeah, I think it's your connection that's a bit slow. Yeah because uh, the team or the class okay, is, is replying. So, fine. so I think about the, that's fine. Because... So for the Montegia, just always remember it's the proximal and you have a fracture of the ulna or a plastic deformation of the ulna and then you dislocate your radial head. Proximally. Proximally. And then the distally is the Galeazzi the same kind where you have fracture of the radius and the, uh, and the dislocation. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring so up. If you remember during my talk, I spoke about before, I spoke about the proximal and the distal radial ulnar joints, which are kind of separate 
to the elbow and the wrist joint. So forearm is a ring kind of a structure. So yeah. you can't break the ring at one point. Yeah, something has to happen on the other side. Yeah, almost yeah. like a pull up. You can't break it in one place. Something has to happen somewhere else. The energy has to come out somewhere else. Um, and, and you can clearly see on this a 3D recon that there's a proximal ulnar fracture and it's pulled your radial head out as dislocation. Mm -hmm. so that's your Montigia injuries. Yeah. Um, I'll bring up the Galati now. Is it similar for a Galati now? Um, let me see a good one. So maybe this one shows a little bit. Yeah. We have a few questions coming in in regards to which one is more common, Montegia versus Galetzi. I don't know if you want to address that. I think Montegia is more common, but you know, it, it, it kind of doesn't follow a yeah. rule. But yeah, Montegia, yeah. you see more uh, with the elbow injuries, uh, especially with the kids' elbows, when there's a plastic deformation of the ulna, so you don't see any fracture. And uh, you think that this is normal, but then after a couple of weeks, you see another view where the radial head is dislocated. Very difficult condition to treat, especially if it's been neglected or missed out mm -hmm. in the first instance. Yeah. And we've had one question in regards so in to the, the... I was just going to say one quick question in regards to the administration of local analgesia, the hematoma block. Is it the same for Collies and Smiths? So... Yeah, I think that what yeah. you do is you go from an area where there is no vascular or nerve structure. So in the wrist, it will be dorsally. You put your needle in, you feel the fracture. So when you feel the fracture, you are in the hematoma and that is what the block is. So you put your local anesthetic in the hematoma. That's right. And then that uh, local anesthetic will block the periosteal you know, um, sensation and relieve pain and then gives you the ability to manipulate the fracture. So basically it is a very effective way of locally blocking the pain from the fracture, from periosteum, and then you're able to do uh, a, a manipulation. Yeah. If you can't do this, then the other options are gas and air, which it's so common in every fracture plaster rooms. Yeah. The other there's block. I think not many units are using it no. now. Again, it becomes difficult. So a hematoma yeah. block is safer in that respect. The only downside is that you're putting a needle in the fracture and you can introduce infection into a hematoma, which mm. is kind of a breeding ground for any infection. But just, so what you can do is be careful all aseptic precautions. You do the a hematoma block, you put a dressing over it, then you pull your, yeah. uh, as Rashid mentioned, pull your fracture, you know, traction, and then exaggerate the deformity. So there's always a way, it's not all, orthopedics is not always just energy and power. It's just about technique of reducing the fracture. I would advise yeah. everyone to read John Charlie's book on fractures. I think there is, it's free now, and there's a link which um, Andre will share later on yeah, about yeah. some uh, educational material for people who wish to do some further reading. But yeah. this is it. Uh, and deformity, you just exaggerate it and then you reduce it. Yeah. And as a so, practical point from a junior perspective, it's always good to make sure you have all of the equipment needed before you start anything in the ED department. You can con combine both. You can start with gas and air while you wait for the person to, keep, to get a bit more relaxed and then do the hematoma block. Remember, it takes a while for the hematoma block to build up. So as long as you maintain a septic technique and give yourself sufficient time, sufficient staff and equipment, everything should be all right. It's a quite easy procedure to do. I think I would recommend give the hematoma block and go for a cup of coffee. <laughs> by the time you yeah, definitely, definitely. Five minutes. Really made a good one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fine, I'll stop sharing again, just so you can share yours if you want. Oh, I think anybody wants to ask anything, just go put questions on the chat box and we'll answer. Yeah. Rashid will answer. I've gone through every, we had a few very small questions. I've addressed all of them by text while you guys were talking, but at right. the moment, does anyone else have any more I questions? Think, I think the videos of these 
TikToks will be on the YouTube. It will be shared on the website very soon. And then we'll also send you some links for um, the books which you can read if somebody wishes to do some extra yeah. extra reading. Yeah. You need to get your x-rays and, and at least before you refer. And also examine, look, feel, move. Examine before and after every intervention you do to an individual so that you know whether or not you've improved it or made it worse. And if you made it worse, that's fine. You've tried to help. You can just ask for help again and then someone can help you fix it to make it better. Yeah, I think that one other thing I would like to assess, uh, to emphasize is um, the use of CT scan. In a distal radius fracture, where it's just, which is intra-articular, the surgeon would like to know the configuration of the fracture. Again, in the elbows, CT scan is needed to rule out what's going on, what mm. kind of a fracture we have. So if your department or your unit has the resources, always get a CT scan done. In 2021, I think the CT has become very um, important in terms of decision-making about what kind of fracture it is. But don't forget, x-rays are important in the acute setting. But once the patient is in a cast or in a, in a back slab, um, all the first aid has been provided. You can get a CT scan, which will make it easier and prompt for the operating surgeon to decide what to do. It's just for pre-op planning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so thank, thank you everyone for making it.